like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine at National University of Singapore and our Healthy Longevity webinar. Thanks for joining us. I have a few announcements to make. First of all, as always, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. And Isla is here tonight to assemble your questions and ask our speaker. So we have a great discussion. Um, second of all, uh, we had a last minute cancellation. And so we're very lucky to have Professor Shanming Zhang uh, here tonight to tell us all about stem cells. And so I'll be introducing her in a few moments. Uh, finally, I've had three people today tell me I look like death warmed over. So I just want to assure you that at least to my knowledge, I'm not dying. I just have a sinus infection and the, the makeup team is out of town this week. So um, doing the best I can, I'm actually pretty healthy at the moment. So no worries. <laughs> and uh, with that, I want to go to uh, Dr. Anna Such, who'll be telling us a little bit about the links between conscientiousness and suicide risk in the second half of life. Thanks for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Anna, and I would like to talk about the study on conscientiousness and suicide risk in the second half of life that we have carried out in collaboration with the University of Pittsburgh. So... Suicide rates are twice as high in the 70 years and above age group than in the 15 to 49 years of age. And at the same time, the risk factors for suicide in mid and late life are not specific enough. For example, depression, cognitive decline, and severe physical illness have all been associated with increased suicide risk, but can also be commonly found in individuals who are not at all suicidal. So this raises the question whether personality could help us better understand which individuals will be particularly vulnerable to specific risk factors, such as the three mentioned above. Conscientiousness is an interesting personality trait with respect to suicide risk in mid and late life, because low conscientiousness that is characterized by being easygoing or careless has been linked to increased risk of mortality and disability, and has also been associated with higher odds of attempting suicide. But at the same time, high conscientiousness, characterized by being goal-driven or meticulous, has been associated with higher odds of dying following a suicide attempt. So in this study, we wanted to know whether in mid and late life, conscientiousness would influence the likelihood or the severity of suicidal thought and behavior, and whether conscientiousness would moderate the effect of other risk factors or fa risk factors on suicide risk. So we analyzed the cross-sectional data of 313 depressed participants of the longitudinal research program in late life suicide at the University of Pittsburgh. These participants were aged 40 years or above, and they had originally been recruited as either non-attempters or attempters. Attempters meaning that they have made at least one suicide attempt during their lifetime. Our first aim was to test whether conscientiousness had a, had a direct relationship with current suicidal thoughts that we also call suicidal ideation. And we analyzed this both in terms of incidence 
meaning whether somebody had or didn't have suicidal ideation, and also in terms of the severity of the ideation in the subsample who had some level of ideation. We also um, tested the, the relationship between conscientiousness and suicidal behavior in a si similar manner. So we looked both at incidence and at intensivity in the subsample of attempters. As some attempters had made more than one attempt, we focused on the most medically serious suicide attempt for this last analysis. We had a secondary aim, which was to test whether conscientiousness moderated the risk effect of depression severity, cognition, and physical comorbidities on both suicidal thoughts and suicidal behavior. Our sample, our sample was aged 62 years uh, on average, and it had an equal representation of females and males and was in majority Caucasian. We found that where, while conscientiousness did not have a significant association with the likelihood of having suicidal thoughts or of engaging in suicidal behavior, um, it had a positive correlation with both ideation severity, meaning the, just the severity of the suicidal thoughts in the subsample who had some level of suicidal thoughts, and also a positive correlation with the severity of suicidal intent at the most medically serious suicide attempt. At the same time, conscientiousness moderated the effect of physical comorbidities on the likelihood of having suicidal thoughts. And this was a negative effect such that in individuals who had one or more phys severe physical comorbidities and who had, um, high, who had high levels of conscientiousness, as you can see here on the x-axis, um, well, these individuals also had a lower likelihood of having suicidal thoughts that you can see on the y-axis. Uh, and in individuals who had no severe physical comorbidities, there was no such association. So in our sample, conscientiousness was associated with more severe suicidal thoughts or more severe suicidal behavior in individuals who were, who were either having suicidal thoughts or had engaged in suicidal behavior. And at the same time, also with a lower likelihood of having suicidal thoughts in individuals who had severe physical comorbidities. So conscientiousness could either add to or mitigate suicide risk depending on individual context. So I would like to thank my mentors and collaborators who are working with me on this exciting project and thank all of you for listening to me and share my email address in case you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so we're very lucky tonight to have uh, Dr. Xianmen Zheng uh, with us. Uh, she uh, received her PhD in molecular biology from the Technical University of Denmark in 2000 uh, and did her postdoctoral work at the National Institute of Health from 2000 to 2005. After that, she joined the Buck Institute uh, in California uh, that you probably heard of. Uh, from 2005 until 2018, where she was a professor uh, working on stem cells and aging. In 2018, she went over to the dark side and left academics and joined um, uh, and, and uh, focused full-time on her company, where she's the founder and CEO. The company's name is RxCell, and she'll be talking a little bit about that today. But she's kept uh, touch with academics. She's a visiting professor at the, here at the National University of Singapore. Uh, her talk tonight will be on stem cell-based therapies for age-related diseases. And Semming, I want to thank you for coming on on short notice because uh, you saved the day for us. Thanks, Brian, for the kind introduction. So it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, but. If I do a bad presentation, you have to blame the short notice, okay? I will, I promise. <laughs> All, right. All right, with that, I think I will go to the slides. Let me share the screen. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about stem cell based therapy for age related disease. And as Brian already introduced, um, I set up the company here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which you can see a nice photo I took. Um, go to the next. So you all have heard about stem cell. So what is a stem cell? Basically, a stem cell is a cell that can do two things. First, it can make another of itself. It's called a self-renew. That's the one probability of stem cell. The second one is that it can give rise to one or more cell type in the body. So this is the property called to differentiate. All right. And then... How many kind of stem cells exist that you heard many? So in a human body, we have over 220 different cell types. But And based on how many cell types a stem cell can give rise to, you can categorize them into different categories. So on top of this is called a totipotent. This is actually the cells in the first stage of the embryo development. So this totipotent cells can make both the embryo and extra embryo materials, including the placenta. So then comes to pluripotent stem cells. These are the cells that can give rise to all cell type. They can make embryos, but cannot make uh, extra embryo materials like placenta. So these cells can be isolated from the first week of the embryo development. And then go to multipotent stem cells, which perhaps are the most common one or you have heard about, or the adult stem cells uh, are multipotent or unipotent, some of them. So they can make several type of the cells usually is within the same organ system. Now, this is the timeline of the stem cell during development. As I just mentioned to you, you have the totipotent cells, which basically is the first three days of embryo development in human. So, and then you get to the first week of the um, embryo development. This is after the implantation into the uterus, if it's in vivo. And in vitro is the first week of the culture of the uh, um, zygotes and then uh, egg embryo. So from here, you can get pluripotent stem cells. And as the embryo develop, and then also to the birth and the childhood and get old, you still can get multipotent or unipotent stem cells. And the ability to differentiate, of course, is reduced. Um, what I want to focus today on is Pluripotent stem cells, as you just heard um, from me, these are the cells um, in the earlier stage of the development. It can make cells of any cell types in the body. So the first uh, um, pluripotent stem cell isolated in 1998, this is the human embryonic stem cells. Uh, again, you isolate it during the first week of the embryo development. These are all done in vitro. You can isolate embryonic stem cells from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst here. And another way to get embryonic stem cell, this is much more complicated, is called a somatic cell nuclear transfer, that you basically take the nuclear out of the oocyte and then um, put the somatic cells nu nuclear in, and then you develop into an embryo and then make embryonic stem cells from there. So the third source of pluripotent stem cells. This is um, coming from um, a new technology called reprogramming. This is um, developed by um, a Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Sinya Yamanaka in 2006 and 2007. So this is very simple. You take a somatic cells and then use the transcription factors mostly in the beginning and then reprogram to embryonic stem cell like cells, which um, uh, Dr. Sinya Yamanaka named it induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are the source that can be used for cell replacement therapy. So 
I want to just give you one example how to make IPA cells. This is what we have done routinely in my lab back here at the Buck Institute. So you can generate IPA cells from many uh, somatic cells, including blood cells. So this is one example. You take um, one blood unit and then expand them and then reprogram them. We use non-viral vector to reprogramming and then get to the pluripotent stage and express um, pluripotency markers here. And of course, the cells can give rise to all uh, cell type in the body normally defined as ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, and giving the example neurons here, muscles here, and liver cells here. With this background, and then I want to go into the therapeutic application of iPA cells. And in this case, I'm going to talk about uh, retinal progenitor cells for treatment of retinal degenerative disease. So let me just start with why the eye is ideally suited for cell therapy, okay? First of all, it's very accessible. So well-established surgical procedures are in routine use and it's easier to adopt a new stem cell therapy. And eye is also a very small uh, or a relative small organ. That means a small number of the cells are required for therapy. And the eye is also a confined and immunoprivileged site. And last three, but not least three, the outcome is easier to monitor for any of the clinic trials. So uh, with at least, uh, with also the non-invasive um, tools, the patients can also tell you whether they can see or not. So one retinal disease that leads to blindness, um, age-related macular degeneration, is caused by loss of cells. So here is the retinal here, and you have the retinal cells here. And you perhaps have heard about um, pigment epithelium cells or retinal pigment epithelium cells, RPE, that has been used in clinic trial to treat uh, macular degenerative disease. Um, so today I'm going to focus on these cells here called the photoreceptors. And that are the light sensitive neurons in the retina, okay? So, AMD layer two forms, wet and dry, okay? The majority of the AMD are dry AMD, which is about 80 to 90% of the AMD. Um, that occurs when the macular gets thinner with age. So there are three stage of the disease development, earlier, intermediate, and late. In earlier and intermediate stage, mostly the RPEs are degenerated, and therefore the trophic factors they release are also reduced. In late stage, photoreceptors are also lost. So this is a um, patient population based on the US population. So the numbers of um, dry AMD. And at this point, there is no um, cure or no treatment at all. An experimental approach, including the cell therapy, uh, mostly involve the um, replacement of RPEs. That is to slow or halt the progression of the um, uh, disease. But replacing RPE alone will unlikely uh, help the patients with significant photoreceptor loss. So our approach is to replace the uh, dysfunction cells with healthy and function uh, photoreceptors. And in this case, we do the precursor cells or called the retinal progenitor cells that is committed to photoreceptors or combination of RPE and RPC to restore vision. So that's the goal. So at the time when we start the IND activities, we had already complete uh, uh, some of the proof of concept studies. And that is the, the studies we have complete by the time of 2021. This include the development of a um, 
good manufacturer practice IPS line. This line is uh, approved by the USA DBA for the um, clinic application. And we have also developed a GMP compliant process and medias for manufacture the RPC cells. And we have complete preclinic safety and efficacy studies in both small and large animals and established clinic partners uh, for a phase one trial in both US and Singapore. So here is the process of how to make this cells. Just, um, just at a glance, you can see it takes about um, three months and goes through different stage of retinal induction and differentiation using, of course, different medias. And this is the stage we use to transform the cells, but the whole process can also be broken down by one intermediate stage that we can uh, cryopreserve the cells, make the manufacture process simple. Um, from here, you can take it out, expand them to final product. Although I said I would focus on photoreceptor, I just want to point out this process can also make the RPE cells in, in case we need a combination therapy of both RPE and RPC. So I'm not going to go to the detailed animal studies, but I just want to show you one slide. This is the mouse study we have done in collaborate with um, Dr. Deepak Lumber at University of California, San Francisco. So this is a study that we use the cells. I just show you the process, how to make them. That's the 12 weeks of RPCs. Use those cells generate from the GMP line and transplant into the mouse retina and look at the um, survive and integration of the donor cells into the host retina. So basically this slide just tell you, this is what it did exactly. So the human cells mark here and also express the photoreceptor markers. You can see it um, survive and migrate into the uh, out nuclear layer of the retina here. So the data are all published. So I'm also going to show you a couple of studies that we have done with non-human primate study. This is all done by Dr. Sing Yi Su's lab in here in Singapore. So she used that we manufactured cells in the US and then we um, ship it to Singapore and her lab did the non-human primate study. There are two of the studies uh, I'm going to show you here. One is the a safety study, mostly to look at the surgical procedure safety. And this is done in non-disease uh, monkeys in the naive eye here. And the other one is the disease model, which we create a disease model, mimic the photoreceptor loss in monkeys, and then transplant the photoreceptors into the eye and look at the functional re recovery. So this is how the cell look. We make the cells in the US, ship it to Singapore, and then her lab did the injection here. This is exactly how the cell look like. Basically, it just tell you they are not pluripotent cells. They express many of the retinal markers, include pen photoreceptor markers, including both the rod and the cone markers here. And they are not RPEs. They are not bipolar cells here. And this is a slide to show that the cells injected into the eye after three months or the animals are still look normal. So this is a safety study. Um, look at the injection site by OCT scan and the entire marker here, one month, two months, three months later, and everything looks normal. Um, there is also no inflammation um, or any of the retinal damage, and despite this is a xenotransplant um, using immunosuppression. Now, this is the disease model. Um, I know it's a little bit difficult to uh, read and understand all this, but I just want to point out a couple of things here, okay? So what we do is we inject a chemical called carbocoli into the retinal here and create a disease model because this killed the photoreceptors and then wait for a month. And then we transplant the photoreceptors derived from human 
human iPA cells and then monitor the animal for three months. Okay, so this are the side of the lesion side. You can look at here, and these are the analyze we pick to analyze after the injection, the lesion side. Just to show you one of the side that, that is normal, so outside of lesion side, which you can use it as a sort of control. I just want to direct your attention to this red arrow here. What you can see, this is normal. So this line indicate uh, um, ellipsoid zone here, and the black one indicate the um, RPE and the bush member complex zone here. So what you see after the lesion, this is one month right the day before the patient, you can see the complete free, uh, disruption of the ellipsoid zone here. You cannot see anything actually here. And this is one month after transplantation, you can see the partial restore of the ellipsoid zone here. And then after three months, it's almost intact. So that's an indication of the recovery, okay? Um, this are just pick it from the different layers of different spots of the same animals here. So this is the functional improvement of the um, animals um, um, after the injection of human uh, RPCs. So this is support by the uh, uh, histologic analyze of the um, monkey eyes after uh, study was complete. You can see the survive and differentiation of RPCs in the host retina. What you can see here, this AC one to one is a human specific marker. And then you can see the localization of Opsin, the staining, this is specific for the cones. And you can see the cells not only survive, but differentiate. And this is the, on the nuclear layer. So very nice sitting here. Another human um, markers we use to um, just to, to, to be sure that those are the human cells is the anti-human um, mitochondrial markers, which you can see the similar things here. So with that, I'm going to uh, shift the gear to talk about the next generation therapy. And in this case, I'm going to talk about the hypoimmunogenic and in a more later, we'll call it universal cells, okay. So with all cell replacement therapy, one thing everyone has to deal with is how to deal with the immunorejection in cell transplantation as in all organ transplantation too. So apparently the best way to deal with it is um, autologous transplant use patient's own cell, then you will not have any problem of immunorejection, but this can be extremely expensive, okay? Mm -hmm. So in the past decades, um, there's another approach has been discussed a lot. It's called the Hopper Bank approach. So this approach is basically to create a repository of clinic grade IPAs lines um, of many different HLA Hopper type. So in any given population, you have to estimate how many lines you need to um, generate to cover most of the uh, population in uh, in certain countries. So. The most recent or more discussed approach in this presentation is the uh, approach to engineer the iPA cells to evade immunodetection. This is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so to start with that, there are the strategies to do the engineering. So one of them is involve the uh, engineering of the HLA molecules. So here are the class one of the HLA molecules here. And you can see they are the uh, domains here, B2M, and the other one is the HLA, the different allele A, B, and C here, as shown in the figure. And the other uh, uh, HLA molecule is the class two molecules. To engineer in them, most people choose to um, engineer the transcription factors that control the expression of the uh, HLA class two molecules, okay. 
other people use the um, different players in the immunorecognition and reactions to aerograph use these different molecules to overexpress them to achieve the hypoimmunogenic state. So our um, strategy uh, is kind of like both, okay? So we target both the innate and the adaptive immunosystem. So we use both the HLA engineering and the express of uh, immunomodulate factors. So to, to do this, what we do for the class one molecule, we decide to just knock out the B2M gene here, as this is one of the uh, component of all the HLA genes. And for class two molecule, we decide to knock out the C2TA, which is one of the master transcription factors controlling the expression of class two molecules here. And by doing so, we get a double knockout of um, class one and class two molecule in B2M and C2TA. And after that, and then we introduce immunomodulate factors and doing the knock-in here in a safe bubble site, okay? And we chose several of the uh, novel factors for this purpose and generate uh, hyperimmunogenic cells or the so-called universal cells. So I'm going to show you just one example of this cell we have generated. Okay, this is in collaboration with Dr. Yin Liu at um, Florida International University. So this are the line, how we make them. As I just mentioned, we use um, knockout strategy to knock out the class one and class two molecule. This are all done by CRISPR, okay? Um, so this is what the cells look like, the double knockout here. So this is a um, staining up on the uh, inter gamma interfering stimulation, just really to look at the express of the class one and class two molecule. So this is the knockout, as you can see, is wiped out both um, B2M here and the uh, HLA type one antigen, and then the class two molecule here. So using this cells as, um, as a parameter cell, I, oh, okay, I, I, I forgot to mention, this cell also have a GAP knock-in in another safe harbor. This is to uh, make it easier for uh, in vivo experiment to track the cells as we do a lot in the nerve system. So on top of this knockout, we make a knock-in in the safe harbor site. And in this example is the AABS1 site here, is one of the safe harbor site. We introduce um, a novel immunomodulate factor either in IL-10 or MIF-1-alpha or both. Okay, so put into the safe harbor site. If, if you later want to modify them later, you can either um, cut this one out or do a swap as you need. So this is one of the line I just mentioned. We have done a lot of studies with this line and I don't have time to go through all the details. So I just want to mention a few. So we have tested the hyperimmunogenicity of these cells both in vivo and in vitro. So in vitro, just the most common assays like the NK cell killing. And in vivo, we have done the xenotransplant in both immunocompetent mice and also in humanized models, which show the um, long-term survival of the cells um, in the nerve system. In the case, we chose the spinal cord. And the other thing we have done is to differentiate the cells into different cell types for um, collaborate to look at the immunogenicity or hyperimmunogenicity of these cell types. And we have shown the cells can differentiate into the cells of the three gemla. We did our cells, the neural cells, and then uh, also other collaborators are working with uh, muscle cells and also uh, MAC. Um, in mesoderm and then endoderm, we are mostly working with the ILA cells and the liver cells. So with that, I just want to 
Thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, Siamin. And it's great that you mentioned uh, Su Shini. Uh, she's a wonderful faculty member here in Singapore at IMCB at ASTAR and also affiliated with our Healthy Longevity Program. So we'll have to have her on for a future show uh, and talk more about the retina. Um, so I just have a few thoughts that come to mind and I thought I'd start with a simple question or maybe it's a complicated question, but that's, you know, we've been talking about cell therapy for a long time. Uh, and uh, to people who are, you know, not in the field, it may seem like that they heard that a long time ago, but nothing's happening yet. Are, are we at the point now where we should, can really test and do cell therapy to treat disease? Yeah, I think so. Actually, you know, cell therapy, if you really look, uh, you can you can also say the first cell therapy is maybe like a um, blood transfusion. Yeah, so sure. <laughs> also a type of cell. So I think most people talking about the um, cell therapy, like to treat like a um, degenerative disease, like neurodegenerative yeah. disease and use the novel cell source, for example, like iPS cells or embryonic stem cells. Um, these are more recent. If you think about to treat a degenerated disease in the nerve system, and before this embryonic stem cell or iPS cells, you don't even have a cell source for transplantation. So this um, pluripotent stem cells make it possible. Think about this is still, you know, embryonic stem cell were isolated in 1998. So it's a bit more than 20, 25 years now. I think there is a lot of development into this, but the problem right now is also um, there is no established um, procedures how to do this. So at this moment, we have um, tried to develop this for more than 10 years now, just to have a protocol to get the right type of the cells um, is a struggle. But after that, how to, um, you know, transfer this technology to a manufacturer side because in the US, at least in the US, in Japan, you can do a research trial, but in US, you have to go through the um, FDA and obtain an IND to do so. And to do so, you have to manufacture the cells in a CMO, like a GMP manufacturer facility, which you think about to teach them how to do this that long process, and then to make it consistent and then test uh, also the safety and efficacy. Uh, this is just taking tremendous amount of the time. And for private sector to do so, like my company here, take a lot of um, resource and also just, just too expensive to get there. But I think it's there. We're getting there. We're... We are hoping we can get IND within the next 18 months. That'd be great. I shouldn't forget about blood transfusions. I really would be dead without those. So <laughs> good point. Um, you talk about ES cells and IPS cells. Um, which ones are going to be better for therapy? There's still debate on that, I think. Uh, yeah, I think I first uh, cut your embryonic stem cell, okay? I always think that's the gold standard for pluripotent stem cells, okay? I don't know what one, which one is better, but if you look at the cell source, I think embryonic stem cells, we're not talking about the ethical issues, like in the US, you cannot use um, anything developed from the, or isolate from the embryo or, from the fetal tissues is very difficult, at least to use it for ther therapy. But just look at the source. I think embryonic stem cell is an excellent cell source. And induced pluripotent stem cells has the uh, advantage that you can make it personalized. That means you can derive from the individual and then yeah. make pluripotent stem cells and make the differentiated cell transplant, transplant back, yeah. Are iPS so cells, I, I, how close are they to ES cells? I mean, what, you know, in terms of their behavior, it's, uh, there's, you hear a lot of different stories about that too. 
Yeah. So in terms of be- behavior, I'm a biologist. I'm going to just look at the biology. If you look at the, of course, um, you have maybe you have about the epigenetics, right? Um, methylation, all those yeah, other. Our, our um, audience has heard a lot about methylation, <laughs> believe me, and biologic <laughs> clocks for aging. Either. This is a different methylation in a different context a little bit. So. <laughs> I do think it's an amazing thing. Okay, I have to say, when I first uh, uh, caught your embryonic stem cell, I was at the NIH, I was postdoc in a neurobiology lab. My mentor was the one who created the um, mouse and 6-hydroxy dopamine um, neurons transplant model for Parkinson's, okay. So we, of course, want to make dopamine neurons from the embryonic stem cell, and we get a, a hold of the cells, and we have done many studies with those cells. Actually, even at that stage, we compare different uh, cell lines and look at, uh, at that time, it was 2002 to 2005. Methylation was like not a big thing at that time, <laughs> not like now. Mm-hmm. So even at that time, we look at the methylation pattern of embryonic stem cells and other things in, among epigenetic change during the culture. So I I don't really know, like at this point, that you can say there is a distinguished pattern for embryonic stem cell and for iPA cells. And if you compare them, they really look similar. It is amazing. You just use four transcription factors, you reprogram in like two to three weeks, and then you erase everything, establish everything. But biologically, there is really not much difference between the two cell types. On the retinal cells, you mentioned that the retinal pigment epithelial cells decline first and then the photoreceptor cells, right, in AMD. Uh, I think I got that right, did I? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I would think that even in earlier stages when there's still photoreceptor cells, they may not function particularly well if there's not a support epithelial cell, uh, support epithelial cells to keep them functional. Is, it, is there any data on that? I mean, you may have to replace the rods and cones even at an earlier stage or put some in to augment the function of the ones that may still be there. So the nerve system can work in this way. So if you take about, for example, like Parkinson's disease, um, not until like about 60 to 70% of the dopamine neurons are gone, then you get the symptoms, okay? Mm-hmm. Even at that stage, you can monitor uh, or the disease or at least manage it with drugs. So I think um, um, photoreceptors, they are neurons too. So in the earlier stage, I think, you know, what you have there, and if it still function, even the amount maybe, you know, decline as the cells uh, start to generate, but the functional rate, they can still perform the function. So you just don't notice. I mm-hmm. don't think anyone have done a study like um, to see like how many cells were gone before you see the impact mm-hmm. of the vision. Let's turn to the universal cells. So I think, well, actually, I, I more than think, because we worked together on a little bit on this project, that the mm-hmm. idea behind the universal cells is that you really have cells on the shelf, or in this case, in the liquid nitrogen tank, that are ready to be differentiated into a variety of different cell types or tissues or even uh, cells for CAR-T therapy uh, and ready to go when someone needs them if this technology works. Is that the, is that the idea? Yeah, that's exactly the idea because um, at this point, I mean, for the neurodegenerative disease in the brain or in the eye, um, immunorejection is not the biggest issue. So you can man- you can really manage them also because they are immunoprivileged side. But for other diseases, if you think about to treat um, cardio vascular disease or diabetics with um, ILO cells, and you really need to think a way why, how the cells will not be rejected. So the idea is that if we can make um, universal cells, and we can also, in that case, and like when you mentioned about the CAR-T and other therapies, and then you can 
easily engineering them with whichever car you want. And then you can differentiate the cells into the T cells and put the right car there or NK cells, put the right car there too. And in the hope that you are going to make a cell that is immuno or hyperimmunogenic that can stay in the patient for a longer time. And at the same time, you know, of course, uh, just make it ready before you need to take it from the patients and do all those um, CAR-T um, therapy as they, they do it today. You have to take it from the patients and then do all the engineering and then put it back. So we're hoping that we can use this as a cell source that can treat all indications. Yeah, I have um, to mention for- that we're lucky enough to have an IFCP grant from ASTAR to, to collaborate together with RxL. And so that helps uh, Sushin Yi's lab, but also my lab. So we're taking the universal cells and making mesenchymal stem cells uh, and then testing whether these cells uh, have persist longer in the body using mouse models to start with. So maybe we can apply that to healthy longevity in the future. And we can talk about that perhaps at some later time when we have a little bit more data. I think what I'd like to do right now, though, is turn to Isla Hodzic-Kerk. Don't answer. I don't want to know. I tried. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Isla made me try to say her name, so I did my best. Uh, (laughs) And uh, she's going to take some questions from the audience and ask Yemi. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Brian. (laughs) It was perfectly (laughs) well. Thanks Um, for lying. (laughs) Um, Professor uh, Xianmin, thank you very much for your great presentation. Um, We have plenty of questions from my audience, so I'm going to try to group the questions um, and start with the the first one. Um, So what is the frequency and the route of administration uh, you use to uh, give the pluripotent cells to the animals? And um, how long do these uh, pluripotent cells last in the animal and how are they excreted naturally? Um, So the cells we um, put into the animals, okay, they are already differentiated cells, okay? They are not pluripotent. So that's actually one of the important thing that you cannot use pluripotent cells. Actually, you want to try to avoid any of those residual cells or pluripotent cells in any cell therapy because that can be at risk of um, generate tumor. Okay, so you put the differentiate cells in, you, you culture the cells in the lab or in this case for human trial in a GMP facility. And then you put those differentiate cells into the um, animals. And in this case, when we do the um, animal studies in the eye, we inject a sub into the eye. Okay. Mm-hmm. To answer your question is what, what, what they want to know? Um, yes. The root of, yeah. yeah. The root administration, uh, how long do they last and how do they get eliminated if they get eliminated from the body? So, what what they do is that we put the retinal progenitor cells, and as they get into the right side, you hope they will migrate and differentiate. And in this case, in the eye, it differentiate into photoreceptors. And we did the study in three months in mouse. Okay, so after three months, and then you look at the cells histologically to see where they go and how they survive. Do they integrate it or not? Okay. So in three months, they're still there. We know that much, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the answer. Uh, the second question is, uh, in your preclinical studies, did the animals experience any side effects following the administration of uh, these uh, cells? Not in the models I have shown you. The mouse model, the animals are fine, you know, after the surgery and the non-human primate model, even in the disease model, um, we do not really see any um, side effect because of the cell injection or the surgery. 
What about with universal cells? I know you don't have much data, but is there a risk to having universal cells in the body that are hypoimmunogenic? Um, yeah, actually, I have some data. I just didn't have time to show you. So um, what we see, we when we do the experiment, we always do the uh, non-universal control cell, the parental cells, and side by side. So they actually, we don't see any difference rather than the cells survive much longer. So I have one study that we actually injected the cells into the spinal cord of uh, immunocompetent cells without any immunosuppression. Four, month, uh, four weeks after, that's like one month after, we can see the cells survive really well and then migrate too. And the animals are just normal as, um, as the animals receive the control cells. Um, I would like to ask as well, um, are there some diseases where this therapy could be a uh, contraindicated? What, what do you mean contra? This, where we could not apply this kind of therapy. Oh, the cell replacement therapy. Okay. Oh. Uh, I guess <laughs> if... <laughs> Uh, I, I maybe I'll give you an example. If you think about diabetics, so you can treat them with insulin, okay? So which is which is easier? You can monitor them as the technology advances. Actually, you can monitor your blood glucose level very easily. Um, for cell therapy, you can also think about. I'm talking about uh, type one diabetics. If you can get um, the insulin producing cells into the um, body and then they can produce insulin regulated, um, just like your own um, ILA cells in the body. That would be great. But I don't know if this I contradict to each other or not. I think it's uh, depend on like a different you know, disease. There are many of the disease you cannot treat with um, cell replacement therapy. I mean, that's just um, depend on which disease we're talking about. So I can't replace my whole body then if I want? Can we just... uh, well, we need to build the whole uh, organoid, all the organs and piece <laughs> them together. I don't know how to do that in in, in brain, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You may get a body that look exactly like you, but you don't um, want to. You don't want to replicate my brain, Isla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm yeah. not sure. I want to, but maybe if it put into the wrong body, maybe not good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have one question from David. Uh, he would like to know what would be some of the major challenges and complication of using uh, isogenic-induced pluripotent stem cells towards improving healthy longevity in humans. I think the biggest the challenge of using this sort of therapy first is to make sure it's safe, okay, as any therapy. And as, as any therapy... Safety is the most important. And for this type of the therapy, there is no like um, examples you can follow. So you have to develop the new, um, you know, criteria, how safe they are. So one of the biggest risk is, is just the uh, formation of tumor. So people worry about, okay. So for longevity to treat um, um, age-related um, disease, as I mentioned, for um, you know, one example is the macular degeneration. But I didn't really talk about you know. I'm actually think about you know, use the universal to do the ex vivo gene therapy. That would be an excellent approach. So you can put the um, genes that associate. I don't know exactly which one um, people are testing. You know, I know people have been testing telomerase and others and uh, other genes. And if you can put it into the universal cell and then um, somehow deliver into the body, but I'm talking about the ex vivo gene therapy for um, healthy longevity. Uh, as you guys are studying um, healthy longevity, you know more about which genes to put it in. I'm more like um, to provide a deliver vehicle for you. Thank you for your answer. Um, I think we have some more questions and one of them is, what are your short and long-term plans for your company? 
uh, in the next five to 10 years? And what would you like to see happen? I would like in the next two years, I will get an FDA approval for uh, running a phase one trial using the uh, retinal progenitor cells to treat a um, retinal degenerative disease. That should ideally happen within the next two years. In the five years, I would like to make a um, clinic grade of hypoimmunogenic cell line that we can differentiate into different cell type and collaborate with um, both the academic and industry partners to see if we can, um, you know, use those cells for preclinic studies and see how those cells can, um, you know, um, maybe better for survival and integration. That's my goal. I don't know if that would happen. <laughs> I hope it will. Thank you for that answer as well. Um, another question is, uh, was, was there a sex or gender difference in regards to the positive effects of the stem cell therapy in your animal studies? Um, we actually do not see that, but that's a very, very good question. <laughs> so when we do our research, we actually make like um, both the male and female iPS cells, and then also test the both male and female. Um, but for many of those models, like um, the degenerative disease models like Parkinson's and others, and um, the animal studies are also expensive and very few people will like do a side-by-side -side male and female study. So in yeah. vitro data didn't indicate any difference. But I, I know uh, in, in metabolic models, they typically use males. Is that true in neurodegenerative models as well? Or is... Yeah, my... it's, it's very common. And also for some of those, um, and but, but not always, like in transplantation, sometimes you choose actually females because they are they are calm they are not so aggressive as males <laughs> yeah, we we have a ma males have major advantages we're very aggressive and highly degenerative so uh, we're good for animal models <laughs> <laughs> another question um are there any drug groups that should not be given concomitantly with this stem cells therapy can they, are there some drug routes that can uh, influence the effectiveness of the therapy? Uh, are there drugs that are equally effective as no, cell think, therapy? That can that's affect. actually another question you can answer, but I think the question was, are there uh, drugs that you might not want to use in the context of cell therapy because they may influence the cells in some yes. way? Um, I, uh, not as far as I know, so... I, I, I don't think so. One drug people do use to, uh, in combination with cell therapy, you can say the immunosuppression <laughs> agent. So, but that's, I'm, I'm joking. That's not like to avoid to use. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a question um, about viral vector. There are uh, known viral vectors for inducing the factors of uh, to induce a stem cell, but are you uh, aware about some, could you tell something about the non-viral vectors used for inducing pluripotent stem cells? Yeah, so one of the methods that actually I show in the slides, I just mark it a non-viral, but that's, for example, is like you use like a, like a plasmy a episoma vector that you have all the um, reprogramming factors clone in there, and then you can use, for example, electroporation or nuclear fraction put into the cell, and then they are the vectors. They won't replicate it in human bodies as you as the cell divided, they will be diluted out. That's the non-viral method commonly used. Maybe one last question, Isla. Pick a good one. Uh, many questions, just trying to choose. Um... If you use somatic cells to make IPSD, how do you check if the genetic information is still intact? Okay, so that's a good question. Okay, what you do is that, um, let, let me see if we use the non-viral vector, the episoma vectors, 
to put the reprogramming factors in. After you have um, done the reprogramming, you select the clones and then you expand them. You test the pluripotency and you do the differentiation ability test. But in the meanwhile, you look at the identity. Okay, you can run the STR that you know is matched from the orange cells. And you can also run like at this stage, you will run like, uh, for example, the deep sequencing. You can check everything, actually, you know, to compare to your orange cell type. Um, in 2006 or 2007, at that time, people will just check the pluripotency markers and some of the main markers that um, indicate of the reprogramming. But today, you can do a whole genome sequencing and can check it easily. Most people just check some of the STRs, okay? You don't need to check that many. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Ayla, and thanks, Xiaoming, for a great show. Um, I want to remind people to use the chat function and panelists and all attendees options to leave questions or comments around uh, for the show. Um, there's news from our center and also from the School of Medicine and the credits, so look, for, look out for that. There's QR codes abounding. Uh, one of them is related to people who might wanna join our center and do research with us or participate in our clinical trials. Uh, we also have a number of videos from our center available. There's another QR code for that where you can look at uh, past shows or other videos available from the Center for Healthy Longevity. Next week, we'll have Kui Ling Zong, who's from the obstetrics and gynecology department here at uh, the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. And uh, she'll, she's also a member of our Asian Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. So I'll be talking to her on April 6th about uh, women's aging, uh, menopause, and a variety of other content, uh, topics. Uh, so I wanna leave you tonight with a video of a Arizona man who's 110 years old. Anybody that can live that long in the hot sun of Arizona should be listened to. And he's going to tell you about how to get to long life with five important foods. Thanks for joining the show. Some birthday wishes for an East Valley man. Today, he is 110 years old. Yeah, as Susan Casper reports, the guy is sharing his secret to longevity. If you eat properly, get your rest. Words to live by, considering Bernardo Lapayo of Mesa was born in 1901 and has lived to be 110 years old. They had no automobiles. They had no airplanes. I saw them all come about. Bernardo tells me he's never been sick a day in his life. He walks every morning and eats mostly organic fruits and veggies. People ask me, uh, what do you do to stay so young? I say, well... You've heard the uh, old saying, I know you have, you are what you eat. So what's Bernando's secret? Five foods, garlic, honey, cinnamon, chocolate, and olive oil. Healthy habits Bernando picked up from his father, a doctor who lived to be 98. And he told me not to eat ordinary red meat. He said, lamb is okay, but red meat, stay away from it, hot dogs and and the french fries and all those things, don't eat it. Bernando keeps his brain sharp by being a voracious reader, solving crossword puzzles and playing checkers. I can remember things that my father told me when I was eight years old. A father who showed his son how to have a rich life worth living. And he taught me how to live, how to eat, and to have faith in God, and, and he would take care of me. And so far, it has happened. Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down.